Thank you very much. It's, uh, I don't think you probably came here to have a presentation on the dismal science expecting to be uplifted. And I'm sorry I'm going to sort of meet your expectations and I probably won't uplift you that much. I've been doing this for a number of years at this wonderful conference. And the first time in 2015, I was able to say that actually the economy was looking unusually certain and looking rather good. And your industry was a particular highlight in that. Ever since, it's been a little bit more difficult. And the message again today is going to be a little tough and a little bit difficult, although there are some silver linings I will point to at the end. So if we start on the global stage, I don't think we knew this at this stage last year, but this moment was uh, a really pivotal moment for the global economy. It was from March last year. There's a tweet with coming from the President of the United States talking about deficits, about how bad imports were, but also in the middle of it, it had these eight words. Trade wars are good and easy to win. Trade wars are good and easy to win. And what we didn't realize at this point last year, we were talking a bit about the initial threats on steel and aluminium, which had already been imposed in March of 2018. We didn't realize how much this was a negotiating ploy by the president or how much he really meant it. Well, we do know now, and it's the latter. So we saw from May last year, we saw uh, tariffs being put on China for $50 billion worth of goods. This was a, in uh, retaliation to uh, the US contention that China was cheating in world trade with intellectual property and copyright theft, essentially. And then that was, we thought that might be diffused over the summer, but actually in the autumn, the 50 billion turned to 200 billion. And then over the winter, there were threats that the 10% tariffs would go to 25% tariffs. And we thought there would be a deal done and that wouldn't actually happen. But this May, there has been no deal done. And we have got 25% tariffs on 200 billion with now threats for the rest of all of the US imports from China, another 300 billion worth might be added to this later. And in your industry, I'm sure you know that you are deemed now officially from the US administration as a security threat to the US. Imports of cars are a security threat. There's no action has been taken. It's been delayed to the autumn. But if they want to use the Section 302 rules against the automotive industry, they can. And that's another $200 billion worth of tariffs that might be put on all the allies except for Canada and Mexico. Now, one thing we know about tariffs is that when they go on, they don't come off very quickly, even if deals are done. And just to give you an example of this, I think again in your industry, there, were, there was a, a war, in uh, a trade war in the 1960s called the Chicken Wars. It had nothing to do with cars at all. It was about the import of chickens to Europe and uh, the US put on 25% tariffs onto light trucks or SUVs, and they've never been taken off. Just shows how hard it is to get rid of them. So, and then the, on top of this tweet, I think we also need to look at one more for the global economy, which was that even if you do a deal with the US at the moment, as Mexico and Canada have, that doesn't mean you won't be threatened with further trade restrictions. So what effect is this having on the global economy? Well, if you look at what's been happening to the global economy back to, 20, uh, to 1980 and the projections in light pink here, we see lots of ups and downs. We see the global recession in 2009. And then we see this decade, which has been really remarkably strong and stable with the emphasis on stable, and that's where the forecasts are. So you might say we're not really seeing the effect of trade on the big figures. But the trouble is the global economy is an enormous place and the trade, you'll see it in, in it's really what's bubbling under. And when you look at what's happening in trade and you look at what's happening in manufacturing, you are seeing the effects. So if we look at Chinese imports in blue from all other countries and in red from the US, you see that even the threats of tariffs was meant that the US was not doing as well as other countries in terms of exporting to China, and this is, I've stopped this just at October when the tariffs of 200 billion went on, and you can see what happened to US exports to China 
thereafter. They are now nearly 15% uh, down on where they were at January 2018. That is an extraordinary move. China hasn't retaliated with big tariffs back on the US, but very, very specific ones. This is not auto autos. Essentially, this is agricultural products, which China has stopped buying from the US. But it does mean there's uncertainty, particularly in manufacturing, which is most exposed to uh, tariffs and trade wars. And if you look at the global manufacturing index, this is a global index, you can see that confidence and output uh, confidence has been declining and has gone negative for the first time since 2012, uh, just last month. Now, what's been happening globally is also happening locally. Again, the UK economy has been forming moderately, perfectly adequately over the last few years. This is just us against the Eurozone, against the US. You can, put, If you put the Brexit vote on there, you can see that our performance after the Brexit vote hasn't been disastrous, but it has been worse than uh, the two big economies that we trade most with, the, the Eurozone and the US. And people have been saying, well, how much has Brexit hurt the UK economy? You can do lots of fancy ways of trying to get a really specific number. You can sort of take an average of the gap. That, and then you say, well, that's about 2% of national income. That's about 40 billion pounds. Or as a famous politician, you can say, it's, it's two Boris buses. That's what we've essentially lost so far in, uh, in since the Brexit vote. And that's come not so much from a trade thing, because nothing's, nothing's changed, but it's come really from the exchange rate move after the referendum, where we, it squeezed both corporate and domestic incomes by having more expensive imports. Wages didn't go up in the same sense, and that's hit us by about 2%. Uh, so, if you then look at manufacturing again, manufacturing is at the sharp end. This is where confidence is weakest, where investment again is weakest because of the uncertainty over what's going to happen next. Our picture looks rather similar to that of the world. Suddenly gone negative. Sentiment is pretty bad. There was a stockpiling boost just in the first quarter of this year as companies were preparing for a no-deal Brexit. And you can see that in the output figures. That's the total... Uh, output of the manufacturing sector grew very sharply and then uh, was a big down in April. Automotive transport equipment much worse. Now, of course, that is vastly exaggerated, the, what's happened to automotive because of the shutdowns in certain plants which were in preparation for the temporary shutdowns in plants to, uh, which were in preparation for a no deal. That will recover, there's no doubt about that. But it does show that even when nothing's happening, you can have very big swings in the economic figures. So there is some good news out there. Absolutely there is. And the income squeeze I was talking about has ended now. So that 2% we lost after the Brexit vote, there's no reason at the moment to think that should get any worse. In fact, we might be catching up a little bit now. And we see that real incomes, the pink bars here, after being falling uh, when we had sharp increases in inflation in import prices is now growing pretty healthily for the recent past at about one and a half percent a year. Wages are growing faster than inflation. Employment's at a record, so people have got money in their pockets. So if you're thinking, oh, is the money there to buy your products? Yes, it is. And, and maybe that's quite well known. What's much less well known is who's got the money. And I think this came out last week. It's one of the most remarkable uh, statistics. It's no longer are we saying it's the grey-haired people who've got the money. Growth in incomes is now fastest among the young. Now this is this goes against a lot of the narratives we've be, all been saying that uh, there's a real intergenerational, intergenerational concern. And there is an intergenerational concern, particularly in the housing market, but incomes are now recovering fastest. This is relative to three years ago, relative to 2016, uh, so relative to five years ago. They, uh, relative to 2012, incomes of the youngest group, people in their 20s, have now been growing fastest for some time. So there's been a recovery from all of the troubles that that group has faced. And so the idea that people in their 20s or early 30s are not going to buy motor vehicles, uh, they certainly got the money. So if it, if it doesn't happen, it's much more of an attitudinal change. 
the other good news, and this is that that was the environment you face, is actually what your industry has been doing. We know we've got a productivity, we could call it a puzzle or a crisis in this country. Productivity growth has moved from being about 2% a year to being about 2% over the last decade. Uh, but the automotive industry has been right at the top of that. I uh, said that in 2015, and it's still true today. So if you look versus 2016, what's happened, those are the top industries. The automotive is very near the top and is actually bigger and more important for the economy than the next three above it put together. And the rest of manufacturing is still uh, showing some severe signs of productivity drops. So you've been doing your bit. Your industry is in a good state. But the question then is, uh, how is the UK economy in particular going to, uh, to, to allow you to perform over the next year or so. And of course, that depends on the politics. I don't think we can take this away from Brexit for very long. I've been trying to keep this away from Brexit. But if you ask people what is the Brexit effect, well, the Bank of England put out some figures showing a disastrous uh, uh, impact of a no deal. That was uh, exaggerated for many reasons. If you ask economists more generally, what does a no deal Brexit look like next year? So this is for 2020 in the top bars. In January, they were thought it might be about a, a slowing of growth. Now, it's a bit of really a pretty slow growth picture for, of 0.5%. That sort of picture does include almost certainly a very shallow recession if you had that sort of growth for a, for a few quarters. This is in, almost impossible to predict, but I don't think anyone in the economic sphere, because this is a consensus forecast of lots of people put together. This is why... The figures are not extreme in any way. Uh, but that's the consensus view. Overall, again, we think that the view of the future for both the UK and the world is not a doom-laden for forecast, but it is difficult. And the difficulty relates to political uncertainty. And unfortunately, for the time being, that doesn't seem to be going away. Thank you very much. Can I ask you, what is the economic impact, potentially, of a Corbyn government? I think we don't... The honest answer is we don't know, because they're not very... They're not being very specific. In 2017, they had quite a specific manifesto, which was both tax-raising and uh, increasing spending at a level which we hadn't seen a political party put across before, um, but not at a level that would put Britain uh, into a different league from other European countries. We, it wouldn't turn us suddenly into a... Into, it would still have been in the sort of level of in between the European average and the US. Since then, there have been a lot of ideas that have floated, which are rather more ambitious, shall we say, or extreme, depending on your point of view, which are orders of magnitude larger than that. They've never been adopted formally by the Labour Party. Uh, so at the moment, we don't know. All I, I would say is when, you, when people talk about a basic income or nationalising you know, the commanding heights of the UK economy, all of these things are uh, ex massively more expensive than what was put forward in 2017. I don't think you could do all of them remotely at once. Are exchange controls at realistically on anyone's ad ad agenda, do you think? No, and I don't think actually, J actually John McDonnell, he's, he's going to be here this afternoon, but he has pretty much said this is not something we would be thinking of doing. Because at the moment you get, go into the, a siege economy where people are trying to get their money abroad and you're saying we will do everything in our powers to stop you doing what you want to do with your money, then we're in a very, very different world. So I'd, I would be, that's where I'd be most surprised. Where, where it's, it's just very uncertain what a Labour government would look like, because we don't know, because they haven't really been telling us. Yeah. Uh, 